Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar with EIT Inno Energy. I'm Andy Colthorpe, editor with Energy Storage News. Today, we're focusing on an exciting area of innovation in energy technology, and that's the role of ultracapacitors in the energy transition. Now, ultracapacitors allow for very rapid charge and discharge and can undergo many, many cycles with little or no degradation due to the fact that, unlike batteries, they store energy electrostatically rather than chemically, and they can deliver very high power very quickly and efficiently. Now, it's an area that is very well understood by some people and less well known by others. In this session, we will have the opportunity to hear a number of perspectives from the bigger picture right down to the fine details. Lithium ion batteries continue to broadly dominate the wider stationary energy storage sector and EV space and are likely to do so for years to come. However, they are not the only game in town. In the stationary storage space, lithium is likely to be deployed in complement to flow batteries, mechanical energy storage and other long duration storage tech such as hydrogen, which will grow in significance as their costs come down. But as we're about to find out from today's expert speakers, ultracapacitors can also play a very important role as a complement to lithium, as well as having some potential unique applications of their own. From rapid EV charging capabilities to helping integrate renewable energy onto the grid and lots more uses, the ultracapacitor is a uniquely powerful component, and we hope today's webinar will shed light on the possibilities as well as the challenges that lie ahead. EIT Inno Energy's thematic leader for energy storage, Johan Soderbaum, will introduce you to the topic in more detail, followed by Frost & Sullivan's Thomas Horo, whose team has written a white paper on the present use and future potential for ultracaps in collaboration with EIT Inno Energy. We'll also meet representatives of two ultracapacitor makers Skeleton Technologies and NAWA, with novel and exciting approaches to the technology, and we can learn directly from their customers what they're looking for from this set of components. Now, some brief presentations to follow will be then followed by a round table discussion session, after which we'll host a Q&A where you can ask your own questions to the panelists. You can ask your questions as we speak during the webinar on the tab on your right hand side, please enter your questions in the column and staff from EIT and Energy will be answering questions throughout and we'll pick some of the best um, and possibly most upvoted um, at the end for further discussion. So with that and without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Johan Soderbaum of EIT Energy. Johan, please. Okay, thank you very much, Andy, for that introduction. And um, I will um, do a fly in to the role of ultracapacitors in the energy transition. But first, I will say a few words about EIT in energy and um, just to, to explain the organization as such. Uh, we are a public private partnership uh, that was established in 2010. So we've been around for about 10 years and we're supported by something called. European Institute for Innovation and Technology. And so we, by that, a part of the European Commission. We like to see ourselves as the engine for innovation and sustainable energy uh, in Europe. And what we're doing by that is that we are uh, trying to make sure that we get new innovations, new, new technologies, and new, new services and uh, business model onto the market that is ensuring that we fulfill the goals of, of the, the European Union when it comes to the energy transition. And those goals are, of course, the one you see on the right side with the CO2 emission reduction and so on. But we also are very, uh, see it as very important that we, in the same time, improve the competitiveness of Europe and that we, by then, in, uh, make sure that we have a sound economic growth and uh, create jobs in, in, uh, the, in Europe. Having said that, let us move over to the topic of ultracapacitors. And I'd like to start by looking at the energy landscape and how that is changing and changing rapidly, I would say. Uh, we can see that on the supply side, where renewable energy resources is coming on 
at a very quick pace now. And we can see it on the photovoltaics, for example, which are competitive now in most markets. And it's uh, actually the fastest growing investment uh, uh, area of, of the renewables that we see today, or, or actually by all the generation capacity. We also have the heavy investment in wind power, both onshore as well as offshore. If we look at the other end of the system, which is the demand side, then, then we see that more and more of the sectors are being electrified at a quite high pace, actually, also. Transportation, we can see that in the quick uptake on electric vehicles. Industrial, where a number of, of um, uh, industrial processes are now supported by electricity rather by, than by fossil energy carriers, as well as on the residential side, where we see that heating, for example, now is served by heat pumps, thus electricity. So, uh, and this is going quick, uh, and which is very encouraging, but it also rises some challenges on, on several levels of, in the system. And again, looking at generation, we can see that we get a lot of non-controllable intermittent generation into the system, and meaning that we will have some uh, gaps in the power supply at time uh, times. Uh, that for the system means that we need balancing at different time scales from frequency response to uh, longer time scales. Uh, we also see that the inertia in the power system is, is going down due to the uh, removal of rotating machines in the big power plants. And on transportation side, we can see that uh, autonomy is high on the agenda. And we all heard about range anxiety when it comes to electric vehicles, for example. Also, it becomes more and more important with efficiency uh, in, in subsystem and uh, there, thereby energy recovery. So uh, from our side, we see that energy storage is one of the solution, uh, probably the most important solution to, to these challenges. And uh, on this picture, you can see uh, many different technologies that today are used uh, in order to, to mitigate the, the challenges that we were talking about. And uh, the uh, most prominent or the go-to solution, I would say, for the last years uh, when it comes to storage, uh, at least to new storage in, in the system, is batteries. And uh, specifically, I would say lithium-ion batteries that has been promoted and pushed by the automotive industry that, that really is uh, uh, demanding a large uh, uh, number of batteries, which is driving down the prices and makes them, and also increasing the uh, specifications, all of, but makes them more interesting in several applications. However, uh, what we have seen is that the, the new generation of ultra capacitors are really stretching the envelope for uh, the applications uh, that they can fulfill. And that makes it very interesting to look a little bit closer to, uh, to what they can do. And this is what uh, we have been doing together with Frost and Sullivan, the white paper that we are launching. Brief history of uh, ultracapacitors, uh, invented in 1950s um, by General Electric. Uh, not really commercialized until in the 70s by uh, NEC of Japan. And then it used in computers as uh, a device, storage device that did not need to be changed during the lifetime of the computer. However, uh, there's been quite a slow uh, penetration uh, uh, in other applications and mainly due to high cost, uh, but also due to focus on other technologies, as I were talking about, like uh, batteries, uh, of course. But recently, the, the energy transition and, and uh, the focus uh, that that is putting on, on uh, different uh, challenges has really uh, increased the, the interest for uh, ultracapacitors. So if we look a little bit closer to what they are and, and what they can and what they can't do, uh, we see that the benefits uh, are quite uh, interesting. The very major advantage of, of, of uh, ultra capacitor is the ex extremely high lifetime, both when it comes to uh, number of cycles they, they survive, but also the shelf life for 
for the device as such. Low maintenance, but also the ability to operate in a wide temperature range is very interesting. And again, still there remain some, some challenges, uh, which is the cost and in some uh, instances also the, the low energy density compared to batteries. So given uh, the specification we have for, for uh, ultra capacitor, we have been looking at the applications in some different key industries and sectors. Uh, and we know that uh, across all these sectors we've been looking at that the ultra capacitors have a place to fill, either as a complement or as a replacement to existing technologies. Uh, we also saw, see that there are common drivers across uh, the instrument, uh, uh, industrial sectors, such as the need for uh, reduced emission, which uh, needs to make devices or processes more uh, energy efficient. Uh, we also see to some extent that uh, distributed devices such as IoT devices uh, require also distributed energy resources uh, which uh, of a small scale, scale but high power and, and this is a, a position where ultra capacitors definitely can, can uh, come to big advantage. So if we dive in a little bit uh, deeper into each of these sectors and look at the, the advantages that we can see there. And starting with automotive, we see that even on, on vehicle level, we see a need for more de decentralized uh, short-term power sources uh, to handle a system like uh, cooling fans and uh, body control or, or other electrified uh, uh, parts of the vehicle, which is becoming more and more. Specifically, if you go to a full electric vehicle, this is interesting. Uh, we also see in the future, if you look a little bit longer ahead, that when we get into autonomous vehicles, they need to, will need to interact with the roadside environment, meaning that there is a lot of uh, communication that needs to be done between vehicles, but also between the vehicle and, and the uh, traffic environment. And that needs also uh, local power sources. More detail on the applications. As soon as you hybridize a vehicle, then you will need start-stop functionality, engine cranking, uh, high power applications, excellent for ultra capacitors, and not the least uh, kinetic energy recovery system to handle the brake power and, and re reuse that, storing it somewhere. And uh, here you need really high power applications, and this is excellent for, for uh, ultra capacitors. Uh, expanding this area a little bit into more of a, a, a holistic transportation than rail, bus, track, marine, off-road equipment. We see that also here the, the hybridization is, is coming quite strong and, and we see engine cranking and start-stop functionality as being very, very uh, interesting in this case. And again, uh, of course, uh, kinetic energy recovery and, and, and uh, in some ways of, is definitely of, of high interest here. So, uh, One interesting fact is that uh, one of the first applications for ultra capacitor was actually on trams where they were operating in catenary free oper uh, operations. So part of the tracks not covered with overhead lines uh, were were uh, handled by uh, the vehicle by uh, having ultra capacitor on board. So already quite early, the uh, ultra capacitor had a, a transportation use. Moving into power grid, where we are looking at generation, transmission and distribution and industrial applications. Uh, again, there are gen sets in this world uh, that need uh, cranking and startup. Uh, but I'd like to point to a um, different application, which I believe will be quite interesting for, for, uh, for future applications. And that is adding synthetic inertia to, to a transmission system. Uh, this is something that, that is needed and generally handled by, by uh, um, adding uh, uh, or running uh, power plants in, in existing power plants in different ways. But the, actually the quickest way to add uh, uh, inertia to the system or high 
power application to the system is to add some sort of storage. And in this case, um, supercapacitor, ultracapacitor can be an extremely interesting way. We have another uh, application, which is pitch control for wind turbines that we've been looking at. I will not go into that because uh, the next presentation will dive a little bit deeper into that subject and explain it more. And finally, coming into the industrial applications, which are quite uh, diverse, uh, uh, we see that also here, if uh, we have systems that are operating, uh, moving around high masses, big masses, such as cranes or elevators, and also in oil and gas industry, energy recovery systems are of high interest. Uh, and here I'd like to point also to another application that's uh, extremely interesting and also growing very, very rapidly. It's uh, autonomous guided vehicles. And these are the, the robot vehicles that are running around in warehouses. And uh, that's, that market is growing extremely quickly. And uh, the, the interesting thing here by adding uh, ultra capacity to, to a, a AGV vehicle you have the opportunity to, to minimize the, the number of vehicles that is necessary because you can charge them extremely quickly within seconds and then keep them running in the warehouse, which is a, a, a very interesting for the business model. Uh, finally, here it's worth pointing out again, IoT devices, Industry 4.0. Interesting because you will have a number of devices that need powering uh, in uh, uh, different locations uh, or across an industrial environment. And again, here the ultra capacitors are, are, are of great interest. Finally, then, uh, um, we believe that ultra capacitors have quite a bright future. And just looking at the current generation of, of cap ultra capacitors, uh, it, it is competitive in, in many, many ways, uh, as we've seen here. But also we, we believe that within the coming 10 years that, uh, that we, we will see a significant drop in the price point of, of uh, capacitors, but also an, an increase in, in the energy density. Furthermore, we, there, we know that there's quite a lot of research in, in a new uh, uh, concept for ultra capacitors using new uh, materials for the uh, electrodes, but also uh, looking at uh, hybrid devices where you are using electrochemical storage as well as uh, the electrostatic storage. Changing the, the specifications for, for the the capacitor, but still keeping the very interesting high power and long cycle life uh, specifications. And for the, the, the demand drivers for ultra capacitor will not decrease, rather the opposite. We know that the focus on the energy transition will just grow and hence there will be a need for this type of technologies in, in the applications that uh, have been shown. And also on the demand side, again, uh, electrification uh, uh, and automation will drive the need for ultra capacitor and open probably new applications uh, as it comes along. So having said that, uh, I thank you and I'd like to hand over to Thomas who will dive a little bit deeper in some of the use cases for ultra capacitors. Thank you very much, Johan. As mentioned, uh, this is a very exciting area and there are many different uh, applications that uh, sort of can be where we can use ultra capacitors. But, uh, you know, today I'll highlight three key sort of exciting areas that uh, we would like to provide some more insight on. And uh, if we look into ultra capacitors, you know, mentioning, of course, in many different areas, some of them make sense, some do not. So why ultra capacitors in some areas? Well, certainly the sweet, sweet spot really is where there's a need for high power short-term energy, of course, ultra capacitors make sense. Uh, also, where there's a number for high operation cycles, because you know potentially they have uh, up to a million cycles, they have a long lifetime, so it really makes sense as well to use ultra capacitors. And again, where we have the need for sort of multifunctional things such as 
not only power supply, but also voltage regulation. So for example, if we look at microgrids, you know, we need both of those. So these are many benefits that ultra capacitors can provide. Also, the ability to work in extreme conditions. Uh, you mentioned a high you know, temperature band, which is much wider than um, batteries. And that's a key advantage of ultra caps because it can be used in many sort of different hostile environments. And of course, because um, ultra caps are expensive relative to existing technologies such as batteries, you know, those applications that have a high operational load make sense because they're being used regularly. So the savings that the customer gets is worthwhile and, and worth the investment. However, as we mentioned, and you've mentioned before, there are key challenges that remain. You know, you have the, the price, which is very significantly more than, say, batteries. And really, the energy density is obviously low relative to batteries. So these are key areas. But despite these, when you have the sweet spot, ultra capacitors make up for those differences or weaknesses. And also, one thing we need to consider is our ultra caps will also require a redesign of equipment architecture for them to be integrated. So that's another challenge. Regardless, uh, there are these applications which make sense, as I said. So looking at three of them uh, in detail today, we have lead acid battery replacement or hybridization, wind turbine pitch control, and also various industrial applications such as uh, cranes and, and uh, elevators. Moving on to lead acid battery replacement. Uh, obviously, lead acid has been a technology which is very established. It's very cheap. It does the job. But the weakness is that it needs to be replaced very often, often every two years or so. So this is quite a cost for operators. And ultra caps here have a huge advantage, as I mentioned, in having a much longer lifetime. So they don't need as often replacement and reduces the operational cost. So you make up for the, the, the price that you pay. And if we look into the future, really there's a trend, as you mentioned, Johan, towards electrification and automation. And that will mean increasing power demands on the primary power source, the, the battery in this case, which is not really sustainable in the future. Batteries would either get, have to get much larger or we have an alternative power source through Altercaps, which makes sense. So this is a key area where ultra caps can be used. And if we look at in terms of advantages, uh, we are not saying that ultra caps would replace batteries altogether. What we are saying is that ultra caps could be used in a hybrid context with a battery. So of course, taking over some of those high power applications, uh, such as stop start applications at the moment, but really moving on to a wider number of applications such as uh, angel throttle, cooling fans, oil pumps and so forth. Now, as we know, electric vehicles are becoming the norm, and Frost and Sullivan forecasts up to 125 million vehicles by 2030, and this will increase the need for secondary power sources in these vehicles, also due to autonomous vehicles communicating with themselves and with the infrastructure as mentioned. So really, uh, ultra caps offer a big benefit there. Also, the fact that they're fast charging helps overcome the, really char the, the key charging issue we have right now with electric vehicles. Another key area, of course, is pitch controls in wind turbines. Now, uh, you know, ultra caps are not entirely new to this industry. Uh, we estimate that up to 30% of turbines currently equipped with ultra caps, but certainly we see a further penetration of ultra caps within this segment, um, really for optimizing performance of wind turbines, because um, as mentioned again before, you know, these wind farm operators under high pressure to increase the yield of the turbine, so they want to position the the blades in the optimal way to be able to maximize the yield of wind energy. Also, when there's a lot of uh, bad events, uh, weather for events, they also want to protect the blades by turning them away from the wind. So this is a very key uh, area for ultra caps to, to provide value. And we certainly see wind as a key power uh, generation source in the future with up to 55 to 70 gigawatts being added yearly to 2025. So there is a huge amount of uh, growth potential in this area, especially in the offshore segment, which is often hostile environments. So the fact that ultra caps can work in very extreme uh, temperature bands is a real benefit. But really, if we look at uh, the, the key value proposition here for pitch control, it's really you know the, the failure rates which are associated with wind turbine pitch control systems, which is up to 25% in some cases. And that's really a loss that the wind farm operators would rather avoid, especially when they're trying to become competitive with other forms of technology which are established 
and cheaper, such as fossil fuels. So really, there's a big drive towards minimizing operating costs. And ultra caps can help wind farm operators do this. Finally, if we look at the industrial segment, again, that covers a wide different variety of applications. But we've highlighted three here just to give you an idea of, of the potential for ultra caps in this area. So elevators and cranes, big pieces of uh, machinery that use a lot of power. And of course, through using curves, we really reduce the amount of power demand for these equipment, improving efficiency, reducing emissions. So obviously storing energy during the downward movement and using that during the up movement and reducing energy consumption. Also, we see that uh, you know, uh, emission controls, for example, in ports is becoming a big issue. So there's a lot of microgrids that are being developed there. And ultra caps can provide functions of peak power shaving as well as power ba balancing. And if we look at a power tool such as drills, of course, the benefits of ultra caps are slightly different. But here it's really got to do with long lifetimes because of a high number of cycles and also being able to operate in extreme environments. So overall, if we look at the actual quantified sort of benefits from ultra caps, we can see 30 uh, 34 efficiency in cranes in terms of improvement and 70 percent in terms of elevators, elevators, which are huge numbers. And of course, there are additional benefits, as I mentioned, in terms of peak power shaving and also the need to have smaller engine, perhaps in crane in terms of startup and so forth. So there really are a huge amount of benefits that uh, ultra caps can provide within the industrial segment as well. So this is just to give you a flavor of the different kinds of uh, you know, application areas or use cases, there are many more, but these are three that we wanted to highlight. And on this basis, I'll hand over to Johan Helsing from CVT. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for introducing me. Yes, I'm uh, Johan Helsing, a senior technical specialist at the company CEVT, an innovation part of uh, Geely Automotive. And uh, I'm very grateful for being invited to present my view on one interesting application for ultra capacitor for hybrid cars. Uh, and for this, I need to give you a short background of the two major trends within the automotive industry uh, for the moment. We are in a transition with high focus on electrification, but also higher efficiency. And I want to show this uh, picture so you can see that the European requirements for CO2 emissions for 2025 and 2030 can be described as a Pareto front where you need to you, you can find several solutions for each company. And the important thing as you reach the blue or orange line in 2030. The plug, the, the uh, X axis is the CO2 emissions and the Y axis, the number of plug-in cars. And for 2025, the expected sales are 10 to 15%. So we can see that, uh, from this graph that at an average EU level, we need to have the plug-in cars, non-plug-in cars at 90 grams CO2. This is uh, uh, quite, you, you need a high ambition on the electrification to reach these plug-in vehicle sales, but you also need a high ambition to read the efficient vehicles of 90 grams CO2 per kilometer. So that is my main point that we need to work with both quite actively. The hybrid electric vehicle, which is then for making the vehicles more efficient, more fuel efficient, would require an energy storage about 50 watt hour per kilogram, three to five kilowatt per kilogram. And we need to be capable of using it very dynamically. And typically we can see that there is not an energy storage which, which fits perfectly to this so today we use power optimized, typically lithium ion batteries. They need to be a bit oversized. We have to limit the dynamic use and we have to handle a temperature window, which is more narrow than we would like. So if ultra capacitors would be possible to reach this spot more to the right then for the capacitors, there should be a quite nice market available for them. The predictions right now for 2025 is we will sell 15% to hybrid electric vehicles. Just to note that ultra capacitors are still quite interesting for our 12 volt power supply systems. 
We already have them in production in our CMA platform, and they will become even more important going towards autonomous vehicles. So shortly summarizing, a hybrid electric vehicle is important for the coming years. We need 50 watt hours per kilo and three to five kilowatt per kilo on a pack level. We need a high number of cycles, at least 100,000 full cycles. We need a larger temperature window, then we can have a, a, a nice application for you. So thank you for me. Okay, thanks everyone for watching the webinar so far. Um, I hope you found it as illuminating and exciting as I have. And um, yeah, we'll carry on with an even more dynamic part of the session today. We're having a roundtable discussion. And um, firstly, just want to say thanks very much to Thomas from Frost & Sullivan. Uh, he won't be joining us for the roundtable, but obviously, thank you, Thomas, for your hard work on the white paper, which will be available, obviously, for further perusal. And remaining with us is Johan Soderbaum from EIT Inno Energy, and other Johan, Johan Helsing from CEVT is still with us for the sort of third party customer view. Um, and also I'd like to welcome onto the stage now two technology providers in this uh, exciting class of technologies. Egert Valmra, who's the program director with Skeleton Technologies. Egert, hi, if you'd like to join us now. And also with us is Ludovic Eviard, who is the general manager and also founder at NOAA Technologies. Hello, Ludovic. Hey, Andy. Brilliant. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. And we've got a few questions that I think we should uh, to, should get through. Um, we would like to maybe start off with a, perhaps a bit of a general question, I suppose. Um, and that is really that uh, for you, Johannes, um, EIT and Energy being a crucial player, as many of our viewers will know, in the European Battery Alliance, and that's helped to direct billions of euros of investment into advanced battery fabrication and the supply and value chain in Europe. Um, do you think we could see a similar sort of effort um, in terms of ultra capacitors? Yeah, um, first of all, uh, uh, the ambition of Inno Energy in um, the European Battery Alliance is to make sure that we in Europe set up a, a value chain that uh, ensures that we have the um, uh, possibility to manufacture sustainable lithium iron batteries uh, that will be able to serve the uh, OEMs that, that's operating in, in Europe. And uh, uh, doing that is recovering the entire value chain and supporting everything from mines to active materials to cell manufacturing and all the way up to, to recycling. And uh, there's been a quite a big effort on that. And in near time, I, I can't really see that we would do exactly the same for supercapacitors. But having said that, uh, there is about 500 plus organizations in the network of the European Battery Alliance. And uh, uh, by joining that, which is fully possible, of course, for, for uh, technology providers or someone that's interested in, in exploiting uh, ultra capacitors, you have an opportunity to, to uh, explo exploit that network in a way where you, for example, get very good contact with customers or with other organizations collaborate with when it comes to development. And stuff. So from that perspective, I think there's a lot to be gained by just the integrating into the European Battery Alliance as a uh, other cap. And furthermore, I think that just by the sheer size of investments that's being put into the lithium ion value chain as it is now, I mean, there are about 17 gigafactory projects that's being established on European ground now. Just by the sheer amount of, of money being put into this, there is a number of development uh, activities and in innovation activities that's going on, which definitely have an opportunity to, to benefit, be beneficial also for the other capacitor, either for manufacturing or, or for actually the other way around, where you have uh, technology transfers uh, between the two technologies. So I think. Already today, there is uh, uh, benefits to be gained by by integrating into the EBA. Right. I mean, I guess increasingly, you know, we're hearing this word used: a, a battery manufacturing ecosystem. And I guess that's re really what it is. You know, it's not just a static 
kind of uh, you know rigid organization so I suppose there's a lot of scope for kind of the movement within that sort of network I suppose and, and outside of it really I guess okay excellent so a question I'd like to put um, across all the panels really, across the panel really I guess um, is that you know it's a real buzzword within renewables I guess is hybridization and it's I guess it's quite important to to sort of really you know the definition of what a hybrid means varies across the board but we've seen some hybrid energy storage systems recently combining for example lithium batteries uh, with flow batteries um, and flywheels um, even with lithium um, and then we've also heard about hybridization across many other sort of types of applications but yeah what's the potential really for ultra capacitors to complement technologies such as lithium ion, not just lithium ion, but such as. Um, and I guess we, we can start going around the clock here. So perhaps Johan, if you'd like to give a, a point of view from, from EIT and I Energy and then hand round the panel, I guess that would be great. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Johan S, sorry. <laughs> Johan S. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's complicated with too many Johans around the table. But, but, uh, let you want to start then. and uh, from Inno Energy's perspective, uh, we already from the from the start the onset of, of the, the organization Inno Energy, where we invest in in uh, different um, uh, organizations and startups that that uh, contribute to the transition of the energy system. We saw that combination of, of uh, these two uh, storage technologies is is uh, something that has an op possibility to to uh, uh, drive down the price point for, for storage system, but also increase the usability, durability of the system. So from that perspective, we have been quite excited on, on both these technologies. Uh, we heard some about this in the presentations, but 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 I think this is a, a good opportunity then for for, uh, for our technology providers to, to talk about this. So I, I would hand the word to, to Eget from Skeleton. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, batteries uh, have uh, the great capability to store large amount of energy, while ultra capacitors have about 100 times more power. So the question becomes uh, whether the applications have long and calm discharge and charge cycles, or are they intermingled with higher power peaks, like in voltage regulation, for example? And when these high power peaks um, are roughly around 15 seconds or so, in most cases, it makes sense to have ultra capacitors in parallel with batteries to cover that power peak. The alternative is to oversize the battery in order to handle these peaks without losing any of their lifetime. And well, it is more cost effective to do that with ultra capacitors instead. And this actually works the other way around. You may need um, a large amount of ultra capacitors to cover the 15 second peak, but if some of the power let's just arbitrarily call it 30% of the power is coming from the battery because it can still provide limited power, then a smaller ultra capacitor pack is needed. So there is a synergy between these two very different energy storage technologies. Hope Excellent. that covers it. Sure. And Ludovic, well, from your point of view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so from my side, I think that, uh, so we all know that uh, a track capacitor in energy density is much lower than a battery, a lithium ion or fuel cells, uh, so whatever technology in fact, but the power density is much higher. And in fact, they can charge and discharge most faster than the batteries. So it is a point. And uh, the ultra caps for us mainly can address any battery power applications with a short per speak load substantially deviating from standby energy demand with very short peak duration. And uh, the supercapacitor could address also any application with the need or wish to have a lithium-free alternative by using, for example, alkaline cells 
and energy harvesting. Right, thank you. Okay, and finally, Johan Helsing. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, I, I work very much with hybrid powertrains, but not really hybrid energy storages, which was the question here. Uh, I see the um, need, uh, or even in the vehicles, for such a thing, but I see also difficulties. So, so far, I would say we have been looking on either more of a battery technology or a super cap uh, and trying to separate them. So no, no combination so far, what I can see. Okay, so that perhaps something to, to look forward to a bit further down the line. Mm. Okay. Well, okay, well, Johan, since you're you're on a roll with answering the questions now, oh, got another one for you here. Um, so there's a trend of increasing energy density requirements in mobility, and obviously costs are coming down at the same time. But um, so yeah, so while hybridization in itself might not be one of them, what top applications in your industry do you see for ultra capacitors uh, in the coming years? And I guess we could look uh, briefly from near, medium, and then to long-term outlooks, um, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, near term, uh, with the existing technology, there are for sure interesting uh, possibilities, and we are already in production with uh, uh, in, within Geely Group for a supercapacitor for stop-start application. There mm -hmm. are, will come other high power, um, yeah, power supply requirements. On, on the 12 volt side, so, so clearly. But um, I, as I presented before, I would like to uh, look more into the medium term, so to say, when we see some improvements in energy density of supercapacitors, so they can replace lithium ion batteries. And then the first application would be a, a full hybrid vehicle where you typically don't need the very high energy density of the lithium ion batteries. And going more long term, of course, if the ultra capacitors can, would be possible to reach there, uh, there could of course be the, the plug-in hybrids uh, or full electric. But uh, I, I would, uh, so far I see that as really long term solutions. Okay. So, I see that the hybrid vehicles uh, on the medium term, I see that as a, a much bigger market possibility than the, the short term. Right, okay, okay. And I mean, as we speak now, we've just seen that um, both the UK and California uh, in the US have kind of uh, committed to more aggressive targets for phase out of internal combustion engine mm -hmm. vehicles. So I suppose that, that near medium and long-term outlook uh, it might well be a dynamic and shifting sort of uh, landscape as we go forward, I guess. Yeah, for, for, for when I speak about the medium term and hybrids, then uh, it, it is, of course, still a combustion engine. So it is. Uh, mm. Sure. OK, um, still a lot of those around, I guess. All right. So um, question now for skeleton technologies There's something that I've written about for Energy Storage News um, a little while ago, and it was something that was fairly new to me. but. Um, I believe Skeleton Tech has a specific solution for kind of pitch adjusting or, or feathering wind turbine blades. Um, and sometimes the connection between renewable energy and energy storage isn't as obvious as kind of storing energy for that old saying, when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. But yeah, can we maybe hear a little bit uh, more about the ways that ultra capacitors can benefit that transition to renewable energy and maybe just a very uh, brief explanation of that um, the pitch control um, offering I guess would be would be great uh, Egert. I will I will try to be brief well <laughs> okay. I joined skeleton um, six years and two days ago and at the time when I heard that uh, there is a blade pitch control for windmills I was wondering why is that needed and I was told that if the uh, windmills get disconnected from the grid they have less resistance and they can spin out of control and in that moment it is crucial to um, quickly change the pitch of the blades of the windmill uh, so that uh, less force is applied. 
Okay, so there's a couple of ways to do that, either hydraulically or electrically. And well, the hydraulic carries the problem of having a little bit too much maintenance needed. The electrical has the problem that if you use cheap batteries, you need to change them every couple of years and the servicing costs are too high. So, well, it was a kind of a bright idea to use energy storage, such as ultra capacitors, which lasts the lifetime of the windmill. So you install it and there it goes. No need to maintain. And of course, we have the possibility to supply very cost efficient modules for these kinds of solutions. Because cost, well, when competing with a lead acid battery is kind of a, an important point. Um, as for the role of ultra capacitors in renewable energy, uh, there was a, a very interesting analysis done by, uh, by academics in England. Uh, they made a thought experiment, how much costs would it incur if 60% of UK energy demand was met with windmills? And because windmills uh, do not have enough rotational inertia, uh, they do not help stabilize the grid. And in order to offset that, you need different power plants on standby idling to provide um, uh, the balancing power input. And the cost of that in case of 60% penetration of windmill power in UK would be three billion pounds per year. And these kinds of uh, revelations have led to the situation where the greed codes of the US and many European countries have been changed so that the renewables companies also need to supply not just energy but power when needed and in some cases this means that the windmills need to run at a curtailed power meaning that the earnings are lower. This is something where batteries can do a certain part of the work, but combining batteries and ultra capacitors can provide a more high power input into the grid, meaning there is no need to curtail uh, the power output of the windmills. So this is sort of one area where uh, renewables and ultra capacitors meet other than just windmill pitch control. Right, okay, okay. So, I mean, I think it's really important that events like this webinar kind of help to raise that awareness overall, really, I guess, of the role that technologies like, uh, you know, innovative technologies like ultra capacitors can play. Brilliant. Okay, well, no one ever said the whole energy transition was going to be a simple one. Um, so yeah, the uh, with NOAA, um, uh, Ludwig, what sort of uh, different applications are you exploring and how can your technology solutions kind of benefit those? So uh, I don't want to, uh, to, to, to put, I would say, uh, on the table an exhaustive list because you have, uh, I would say, a number of applications addressable by UCAPS, and it's, it's really huge. And um, so for now, what we have selected and chose, uh, I would say, uh, uh, those we think have the biggest commercial potential and that fit uh, our technology. Um, today, we mainly explore four domains of applications. Uh, the first one is uh, IoT. The second is, I would say, uh, light electric vehicles, and especially uh, urban LEV. Uh, power tools and uh, automotive. Um, for the IoT, uh, so you have many applications uh, like tracking unit, uh, GPS, GPRS, energy harvesting for the IoT devices using low energy protocol like LT, LoRaWAN, ZigBee, etc. But also you have smart sensors or actuators. 
And the main problem for designers and uh, end users are the size, the autonomy, the lifetime, and the recycling of battery used. Regarding the power tools, um, it's not only the screwdriver you stuck in your garage. Huh? Uh, you have uh, hundreds of applications that cover professional and consumer needs. Um, and more power is, of course, essential to propose better performance. And uh, almost big player are looking new energy storage devices that reduce their dependence on lithium ion batteries and which are safer for the end user. Regarding the, uh, I would say, urban LEV segment, uh, we all see flourishing for three or two wheels vehicles, even one with the entire wheel in our cities. These new vehicles um, need energy storage system capable to manage uh, fast acceleration, fast braking and acceleration again, thousands of times along their trajectories. And the power is essential to deal with this uh, new usage and UltraCap have a big role to play beside current batteries. Uh, concerning automotive market, uh, this is, uh, all know that this is a huge piece of cake. Uh, their new electrical architecture are more complex than thermal vehicles and uh, it needs to address the demands of increased electrical powers, for example, cars, Autonomous, uh, autonomous uh, driving system, power train, embedded sensor, etc. So the common things uh, to all these applications is uh, the need to have some system capable to supply high power burst and to recover energy very fast that uh, batteries cannot do without being damaged earlier than expected. And in that case, ultra caps are the best candidate to meet these needs. And Regarding your second question, um, our technology is based on, uh, I would say, a new materials that allow us to develop a disruptive carbon electrode that is the fastest electrode uh, today in the world. And with this electrode, we have developed and uh, we produce a new generation of ultra capacitors. The material is, uh, just to give you a, a big picture, it's, uh, it's like uh, a, 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 a toothbrush. Uh, it's composed of vertically aligned carbon nanotubes. Uh, it's about 100 billion uh, nanotubes per square centimeter. So it's huge. And these nanotubes are all aligned and oriented in the same direction. And uh, thanks to this structure, our track apps is at least 10 times more powerful than those you can find on the market today. And uh, this new family of track capacitors, uh, we call these uh, NAWA caps, are advantageous for any battery powered application with a short pulse, less than one second. And combine or not with batteries, they bring opportunities to design a device uh, that can be smaller in size, volumes, and uh, weight than existing solution, uh, often oversized, in particular for the batteries. And by handling power peaks, uh, this technology can significantly expand uh, the battery life and improve also the safety. So, if I have some time again, so I can give you so, just an example. Sure. Um, to take an IoT device, for example. Yeah. So the IoT device use many types of uh, battery technology. And uh, so from non-rechargeable rechargeable primary batteries, uh, such as regular double A or triple A, alkaline to lithium primary cells or rechargeable lithium ion battery, but the need to provide a repeated power burst for transmission limits their lifetime, uh, causing early failure or heat problems in circuitries. So, combining uh, the ultra capacitor with a lithium cell, and creating a hybrid battery, has many advantages. If we take a GPS tracking device as an example, uh, it often used to track variable assets, and the conventional approach is to use a non-rechargeable double-A lithium battery, but this is very bulky. 
If you integrate uh, Navacap, you can immediately reduce the reliance on lithium AA to AAA size batteries with superior performance and increase the lifetime as well. So one could also combine Navacap with, uh, I would say, uh, a concern resulting in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, an even later um, a flatter, flatter like uh, package. Um, so it, uh, it it brings a lot of advantage, in fact, for that uh, kind of uh, application, and it could save also money, of course. Excellent. Okay, so I mean, I think one thing that's been really interesting about all of today's event really is not just in terms of what ultra caps uh, are and what they can do. But also, just like with lithium batteries, and you know, like we've seen in the last few years, is a constant process of optimization uh, across clearly the, the technology class. And I think it's been really interesting to hear kind of what that that means for today, um, and obviously in terms of the potential. Um, but you know, bringing us back to, I think perhaps only a small portion, but at least some of the people watching today may only have heard about ultra capacitors and and super capacitors. Um, perhaps if, if only because Tesla bought um, the capacitor maker Maxwell Technologies um, a while back. And of course, a few days ago, we had Tesla's Battery Day where we heard about how that company intends to, you know, their, their uh, kind of wave of disruption or attempts to disrupt continue with, you know, change of materials and so on. Um, but I mean, I see, for example, they spoke um, about how uh, Maxwell's IP is based um, greatly around a novel electrode manufacturing process which they've applied to batteries and it's taking the drying step out of battery manufacturing so kind of removing that wet processing step. Um, so skipping back to the ultra capacitor and super capacitor side of things, are there kind of other synergies um, around lithium battery and capacitor manufacturing that people should know about? Um, and I think further to that, you know, I think maybe just if there are kind of some sort of really interesting sort of areas of around manufacturing and potentially cost reduction and improvement um, that you'd like to really talk to us about um, from Skeleton and then from Narwa's point of view. That would be uh, probably a terrific question to kind of end this portion on and we'll go on to audience questions after that. So Egert, first, if you'd like. Sure, sure. Um, I have to tread very carefully now because battery industry is a much more mature industry than that of ultra capacitors. So saying that they have something to learn from us seems a little bit presumptuous. <laughs> so I'll start rather with uh, what we have uh, to learn from them. And the first thing is for sure is the level of automation in production because the greatest impediment uh, for ultra capacitors to become a mainstream technology, not with a market of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars per year or a few billion dollars per year, but larger, is the cost. Uh, and automation in battery industry has progressed much further than uh, in ultra capacitor industry, where you still have only what we call islands of automation that people still need to be involved to quite an extent between the different automated stations. Um, and I must say in very general terms that uh, here we are preparing to work together with battery companies to actually take the next steps in automation, not only for us, but for the battery companies. So these are the key words uh, what we have to learn from batteries. But there are a couple of things, or at least one I would like to bring out, where battery manufacturers can benefit from the experience what ultracapacitor manufacturers have gained. Um, well, ultracapacitor electrode has such low resistance that that's the thing that gives them a, the high power, right? It has such low resistance that we have had to pay great attention towards how to get that all, all that power out from the electrode and transmit it to the power systems. 
this has not been such uh, a large um, such, such a large uh, deal for battery manufacturers because the battery electrode has higher resistance per se and well if we go a little bit back in time and look for example at the 18650 cell then uh, there are battery cell there are several components that just add more resistance than um, uh, well they they, they uh, contribute about half the resistance of the whole battery and that's not really a problem if you are not taking much power out of it but as soon as you need to take more power out you start losing a lot of energy to heat and ultra capacitor terminal design can eliminate that part or rather there is possibility to reduce the resistance at least if you take an older technology like 18650 cell by about a factor of 8 to 10 so there would be much less heat losses as a result so the that is at least one point where a battery industry good could benefit from our experiences okay well well maybe Elon on the phone soon <laughs> okay terrific um yeah, so no yeah <laughs> okay fair enough um and ludovic um your answer to that so i, I think that uh, so i i fully agree with the girls and uh so there's something that i can hand in fact uh, from an hour point of view is uh, so i explain you that uh, we develop uh, i would say a new electrodes uh the very fast electrodes that could be used also uh, by battery manufacturers. So just an example, we couldn't replace, in fact, the anodes or cathodes with these new electrodes. Of course, we need to have, I would say, some work to do. But uh, we have, I would say, a good chance to have, I would say, a new technology uh, that will improve the battery performance also. So that means that uh, we have uh, really a synergy with the between, I would say, our technology, electronic capacitors and battery manufacturer. Right, amazing. Okay, okay, brilliant. So um, I hope the audience has learned as much as um, as much as I guess I have today um, in terms of what's what's been discussed. But I think so now we want to turn it over to all of you that are watching um, at home or in the office or I guess both these days. Um, and let's have some questions from the audience. OK, so we have had dozens and dozens of questions in. Um, we've only got a fairly short amount of time to get through as many of them as we can. So I cannot. Oh just been refreshed there apologies i hope you can hear me um so yeah i can't guarantee by any means that we will get through all of these questions because there are many many of them um and yeah there's only one or two that directly refer to tesla as well which is a which is a bit of a quirk to see so let's run through some of the through modern technology obviously one of the great things we can do is see how popular things are in real time so we've got the lists of questions but I think one that kind of first came up that is maybe a bit of a light-hearted one to kick us off with uh, was on the difference if there is any between super and ultra capacitors. Um, anyone? I think when we were going through rehearsals. Uh, I think Eggett, you mentioned that you you had a pretty good answer for this one. Do you want to just talk the uh, people at home through that? Oh right. Well, ultra capacitors and super capacitors are both electric double layer capacitors. If you really look it up in your physics textbook, um, marketing department likes to say that they are ultra. Uh, scientists like to say that they are super. Um, but somewhere down the line, I think there was a differentiation made that uh, anything over a hundred farads should be anything below that might be called a super um, but both are electric double layer capacitors you can't go wrong with that the marketing department of course goes with ultra 
Okay. And well, so we got that one cleared up. I think that's a, that's a pretty good start. But I mean, there's another one that's kind of, I guess, on, on nomenclature that I'm personally not that familiar with. And it's a question there from Anthony Valero um, that I think yeah, 16 other participants wanted to know the answer to. Uh, what is your opinion on pseudo supercapacitors and hybrid systems? I can also take this one, I guess, uh, at least get started. Uh, Johan from uh, CEVT as well. So uh, this question and also a question about our proprietary code Code graphene material as well as uh, the Tesla cell size, etc. They are all related to one issue, and this is better energy density, which also ties in with cost. And uh, using a pseudo capacitor uh, technology to get higher energy density is one way to do it. Uh, there are other ways as well, and I can tell you that if you look up uh, in recent uh, media coverage, uh, Skeleton Technologies and KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, then you will see that we have started working on something called a super battery. And this is, again, one of the technologies which can be used to get higher power density while trading, sorry, higher energy density while trading away power density at the time. Um, Ludovic, is that is that one that you've got a particular viewpoint on? Um, regarding the, the last question or also the next question? <laughs> uh, on the pseudo, pseudo uh, supercapacitors and hybrids, is that something that, that you feel like it fully answered really, I guess? Yeah, I hope so. So um, from our side, we are working also and we are developing, I would say, a new, uh, a new technology by combining uh, lithium ion uh, technology and neutral capacitor. So <clears throat> we speak about uh, uh, what we call leak in lithium capacitor uh, technology. And of course, uh, so it's, uh, um, it's probably the, the, the next innovation uh, that we could bring to the world uh, with higher energy density, etc. And uh, so uh, a lot of people are working on it, and uh, in particular, now. But this technology will be probably uh, not uh, accessible before, I would say, uh, two, uh, two years. Certainly, certainly. Okay, and Ege, we're glad to see you've uh, you've managed to get back with us there. That's great to see. Um, so, I mean, I think one question that's been really popular and is one that, you know, I guess we could almost have guessed was coming, but that was in terms of the materials and, and sustainability used in ultra caps. Um, and I mean, I guess, yeah, what is sort of the metals footprint of that? And I mean, the question that actually came in word for word from Jacques Moan was, uh, what is the environmental footprint of modern caps compared to batteries? Um, are they recyclable? And I see um, EIT and our energy has given a, the quick answer that they generally contain no complicated materials so that in that respect the recycling is straightforward. But would anyone sort of care to elaborate on that point at all? Um, but uh, so uh, just uh, a short answer from my side. Uh, so sure. we all know that uh, the lithium uh, Batteries need uh, lithium, of course, but also uh, cobalt. Uh, so it is a very limited resource, and uh, we all know that uh, uh, to extract, I would say, um, uh, that kind of material from ores um, has a big in impact on the environment. So it is really a, a big problem today. And regarding the nuclear capacitors, uh, so uh, it's mainly based on uh, on carbon materials. Uh, aluminum uh, and uh, so some uh, uh, electrolytes but uh, so it's uh, um, it's it's uh, from uh, an environment impact point of view so the capacitor is uh, much cleaner than lithium ion battery technology for sure sure okay uh, Andy? yeah sure yeah. I, I i cannot uh, that 
technology much. I can only emphasize from the automotive industry when we are going to more uh, uh, electrification that the environmental part of the battery technology is uh, or supercap technology is really crucial. So it, it's it's high on the agenda. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Um, anyone else weigh in on that one before we move on? Okay, excellent. All right. So there's, I mean, there's a question that is, uh, you know, I think in terms of the cost versus lithium ion battery. Now that was a, a fairly popular question uh, among the audience, but I think in some ways, my understanding is that it's not an entirely fair, well, not, not unfair, but it's perhaps a, a little bit of a, a trick question in a way in terms of the, you know, the applications being very different um and so on uh, between lithium ion and ultra capacitors but maybe we could just get a sense of how we kind of assess what the cost of an ultra cap is and using one um and you know what are the, some of the ways we can think about that um but then also we could turn that into a two-part question and, and sort of kill two birds with one stone what are sort of some of the ways that you see and you did refer to this earlier of kind of lowering the cost of ultra caps and, and maybe some of the tech breakthroughs that either you've already done or can sort of you know can sort of see coming in in the roadmap ahead i guess that question could be for me for skeleton technologies sure um the the way to look at it is uh not to keep staring at uh, what is the price per kilowatt hour? Uh, batteries uh, have passed the two hundred dollars per kilowatt hour mark, are uh, moving towards a hundred dollars per kilowatt hour mark, or maybe have already crossed that Rubicon. But um, we like to say that ultra capacitors are in the megawatt second business. So we move to megawatts instead of kilowatts and seconds instead of hours. So if you want to compare what it costs to store energy in an ultra capacitor, you should make the calculation, the comparison calculation to batteries uh, based on, let's say, delivering one megawatt for five seconds. And what you will come up with then uh, that it's much cheaper to do with an ultra capacitor. Uh, I am not giving any specific price figures for one very specific reason. This is that uh, depending on application, the specifics of an application, the actual cost of the megawatt second can be quite different. I can, I can just comment on that as well. And I think uh, Johan Helsing actually gave us an answer to that in his uh, presentation but but i mean i think it's uh, it's good to emphasize that it's the functionality that uh, has to be uh, looked upon when, when you're looking at the price point and one one typical application where where it's been investigated uh, to some extent is to replace lead acid batteries as starter uh, uh, start supporting or start uh, energy in, in vehicles and, and there is fairly easy to compare that and find a price point uh, where ultra caps can actually compete on this side so, and then you should also look at it uh, from the perspective that it's uh, it's uh, uh, the longevity of, of the device as such so there are many parameters that needs to be compared in this so it's not just straight uh, kilowatt hour per kilowatt hour here in this case uh, just a uh, comment from my side, in fact, uh, um, if you compare the price, not in uh, euro uh, per kilowatt hour, but in euro per kilowatt hour per number of cycle, okay, the truck capacitor is by far much lower than the uh, lithium-ion battery by a factor of 10. So it depends on what you uh, <laughs> want to, to discuss. On. So, I, I would yeah, I, I would like to comment on the um, comparison uh, dollar per kilowatt hour because the price which is normally communicated is price for energy optimized lithium ion batteries for battery electric vehicles. And when you look on the 
cost per kilowatt hour for a power optimized lithium ion battery, which is for the hybrid vehicle, which I was uh, speaking as the middle midterm application, then the cost per kilowatt hour is much higher. So uh, it's probably difficult to avoid this cost per kilowatt hour <laughs> for us at least. But for sure, you should compare apples with apples. And power optimized yeah. batteries are much higher, more expensive than energy optimized ones. Absolutely. Okay. And I mean, I guess, um, yeah, you I mean you kind of did refer to it a little bit in terms of the key technology breakthroughs. But there's a question here from um, Patrapum who asks, what's the key technology breakthrough in, in ultra capacitors and will it drive cost reduction in the near future? And I think one thing that people not so familiar with energy storage might have learned from Tesla Battery Day actually is that it's a question of taking lots of different optimizations um, and you know going going ahead with that and um, yeah again you did refer to that briefly towards the end of our round table but is that something that you could um, yeah you could give us a, an idea on and and you know in terms of the breakthroughs that are coming or, or conversely kind of those sort of incremental optimizations that you sort of see um, I'm afraid that when it comes to ultra capacitors, it is less about, uh, well, when we are looking in the future, it is less about incre incremental changes and it is more about uh, uh, fundamental innovation or um, disruptive innovation, as some people call it. So, for example, uh, we have the patented material which uh, we call curve graphene and uh, together with the voltage increase this can uh, increase the energy density of an ultra capacitor up to three times so this is this is not uh, a gradual change this is a clear step change and when it comes to super battery i am not going to commit uh, to any specific numbers but again the energy density of those devices should be or should take another big leap uh, forwards um, okay hope that covers most of it is it so we are taking big leaps still is it a super battery or an ultra battery <laughs> Sorry, I have a problem with the internet connection. Can you repeat that question? Oh, sorry, it was a silly one. Is it a super battery or an ultra battery? <laughs> um, ask the marketing department. You know? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a super battery and uh, it sounds good, but in actuality, it's uh, an electric double layer capacitor with something extra in there. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, Ludovic, have you got a, a view on those technology breakthroughs? That I mean, I think, you, again, you did refer to it briefly towards the end of the round table. But if I could just stop you for a second, um, it hasn't yet been upvoted, but someone called Julianne Plan has asked us, and I hope this is something that makes sense to you, can you tell us a bit more about the electric motorbike with ultra, ultra capacitor they've developed last year? So if you could start off with the, the technology breakthrough question, but I, I don't suppose I'm the only one who wants to hear more about that electric motorbike if possible as well. Yes, so I think that, uh, so uh, you speak about Nawa Racer. So Nawa Racer, I would say it's uh, uh, an innovative uh, concept uh, by using hybridization for motorbike, okay? So we are working on it now uh, for several months. Uh, the first prototype that uh, we uh, uh, show was uh, during the CES exhibition uh, in Las Vegas uh, here early this, uh, this year. And uh, we had a lot, a lot of demand and interest. So it was, it was crazy because we had, uh, I would say, a million of contacts uh, for that uh, demonstrator. And we decided uh, to, uh, to develop, I would say, a first uh, prototype, but you will uh, have, I would say, uh, probably um, you will uh, you will have a, 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 a presentation, I would say, before the end of the year. This is objective, so we are working hard on it, and uh, so um, we hope that uh, uh, it will uh, 
have a, a big interest also uh, for the next uh, the next coming uh, month. So nothing to to uh, to say for the moment more because uh, so it's uh, quite uh, again uh, in development. But uh, so we have a uh, uh, we have a, a real a real success interest in in this uh, in this motorbike. So uh, it's uh, a good story. That does sound pretty exciting, doesn't it? Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, bikes are pretty pretty fast as it is, but with the uh, yeah, ultimate acceleration, I think it's going to be it's quite something. Yeah, to yeah. The regular acceleration and uh, and also to show that uh, we could uh, double or triple the autonomy of a motorbike by using hybridization. This is also the goal. So, so uh, if you optimize, in fact, everything uh, in terms of uh, power consumption and, uh, of course. You uh, recover the, the kinetic energy uh, by braking, etc. So uh, you can have a very, very uh, high performance uh, with that kind of concept. So this is the the the, <laughs> the objective of uh, Noah Racer. That's absolutely awesome. So excellent. All right. Well, I think we're probably coming on for for getting to the end of our session today. Um, I think we managed to get some some good uh, good answers to some really good questions, and I'd like to thank everyone watching for you know being so engaged and, and coming up with those questions. Um, I think realistically we're probably going to have to to call it in for time for now. Um, but I think one thing that remains is oh, and actually one question that we can answer is. Will the slides be available for download um, or by email after the session? And quite a few people asking that. And yes, they will. Uh, we'll be publishing uh, some of the materials on energy storage news um, if we're allowed to, Johan. And uh, yeah, OK, so yeah, we're delighted to do that. Um, and the other big thing to mention, of course, is the white paper that Thomas from Frost and Sullivan referred to. Um, that will be available. It's not quite available yet but it will be available in the next few days uh, from the EIT Inno Energy website. Now you can see there's a call to action uh, on your screen in front of you there, and you can click to visit that page and maybe hold the bookmark for that. Um, and then, you know, check in a couple of days time. Uh, I believe we will also, if you gave your email details, we will be sending out um, an email about that to everyone who attended or at least registered for the webinar. But yeah, so that address is www.inoenergy.com forward slash discover dash innovative dash solutions forward slash reports. Um, and yeah, otherwise, uh, if you didn't catch all of that, just go on the EIT Inno Energy main website and there will be a landing page for the reports from there. So I'd really like to thank all of our participants today uh, for what's been a really lively webinar. We've already had some nice feedback from some of you uh, that you were enjoying it, so I really appreciate that. And I guess that's all from all of us today. Thank you very much for joining us, and don't forget to visit that page and get yourself a copy of the white paper as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.